But uh, you created Small Small Small. Did you really think you were possibly creating the Bronx National Anthem? <laughs> is that the anthem song? I don't know if it still is. <laughs> it seems like that's the case. Uh, <laughs> is it the <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, no, I, I didn't know that. The story behind that song was um, Jason said to me uh, that he really liked the opening theme song to Sesame Street. And he said, can you, can you write a song for Pinkie Pie that's inspired by that? And like, that sounds like Sesame Street. And I listened to Sesame Street and this little kid sing. And I thought, well, this is happy, of course, really happy, but maybe, maybe I'll try to do something different. And actually, I wrote it, it was a lot slower in tempo. It was even longer. And Amy's script was like eight pages of lyrics. And it had a whole big rap or something in the middle of it. It was, it was totally it was quite something. And uh, yeah, I, I, I presented Jason, uh, Jason, the director. He was like, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's nice, but it feels like it's kind of sad. <laughs> Hey, wait, just give me give me a day, I'll get back. And so Shannon, who had sung that song, came, I had her sing I mean, I had to teach her a little song, and she sang it for like an hour or two for the demo. I'm like, Shannon, can you come back in? I need you to sing it all over again. She's like, what? <laughs> so I did it, and I sped it up by like 30 or 40 percent, like quite a substantial amount. And um, and, it, and it got the song, song shorter, it's still a long time. And uh, she said, if you sang it again, and I presented it to him, and yeah, I was like, what about this? And it's weird, because Time, it felt so fast, like, too fast. But now it's like perfect, now it feels right. But um, anyways, and then I, I chip in from the next day and he was like, yeah, this is more like it, okay, this is fine. <laughs> so, at the time we didn't know it was gonna be a hit song. We just thought, oh, it's just, you know, any other song in the series. Um, so it's really cool that people have responded. It's, like, I think I get more positive response from that song than anything. In this day aria. Yeah, like this day aria affects people in the way that they seem to be impressed by. Them. But Smile Song is more like an emotional thing. Like more people say that they had like a hard time that they were going through, or or there's even that you know a story of some a young person who was in the hospital who who they played it for or something. And I have a friend who's actually a music therapist in Vancouver. And part of what she does is she sits down with the kids with her guitar and she sings a song and kind of does music therapy with with, with children. And um, when she started to hear about My Little Pony being popular, I said, hey, you know, I'll give you some music, some sheet music for some songs you can play for these kids. And so she didn't really know anything about the show. And one of the songs I taught her was Small Songs. It's quite easy to play on the guitar. And, uh, and she started playing it for all her kids like on a regular basis. And then, of course, then she was surprised to learn that these kids actually knew the song. <laughs> she hadn't heard it before. So yeah, it's been a really good song for kind of just making people happy. Which is good. This day already, I don't know if it makes you happy at the same time. How do you interpret that and create it into something that is your own? Um, that, a, yeah, that's a good I mean, that's, that's always the question is where's that balance? I, I try to listen to something once and kind of rationally just hear, theoretically, like I hear what's going on at some level, you know, without sitting down at the piano and figuring it out. And then I just put it away. And I go, okay, I've got that impression. Now I'm going to do my own thing. And, and I try to get away as far as possible from the original. In some cases, they pull me back. Oh, we want it more like that. You know? And so I have to sort of walk that line. Uh, fortunately, on, uh, fortunately, on this show, now we don't do a lot of references anymore. I mean, in the early seasons, it was really like, let's, you know, like, let's kind of do something that's inspired by this or that, like Stephen Sondheim or something. Um, now, now I see less of that. Now they're just like, Dan, do your thing. Once the song is actually written, how do you go about finding the right musicians to perform it? Um, well, that's a good question. I have a, the way we, you know, when you're working in television, I mean, I have an average write two songs a week, plus I do school. So there's a lot of output. And this is just, you know, one show out of a few shows that I'm writing songs on. And so, um, I, in order to do that, you can't use live instruments as often as you would like. So, we, I always use live guitars, I always use live um, uh, bass and live handles and picked instruments. But like all of the orchestra you hear is synthesized orchestra, and uh, the drums are, you know, sample drums. Um, and so, 
what I have is I have a, uh, some really good guys with me who are producers who have so, so a lot of people here might know Orchid Tech, my, my partner Stephen Andrews. He uh, he's really good at orchestrating like orchestra. And then I have David Corman who's an incredibly good like guitar player. And then I have uh, uh, Trevor Hoffman who's a really very good vocal arranger and also um, synthetic programmer. So when a song comes in, I'll say, okay, here's here's the song now. It's recorded, there's vocals, there's piano, I put in some, some basic production, and then I need to move on to the next song. So I, I sort of produce that with them, and I'll say, okay, well, why don't you put in the guitars, you do some orchestra, you put in some synths, and as a team, we produce the song, okay. and that usually takes our, our facility like a couple of days. Was there ever a song that didn't do as well as you were told? It could be variation. Uh, yeah. What did I think was going to be a really big hit? <laughs> I think uh, the Wonderful Rap. No, I didn't write that. <laughs> well, that was amazing. That was that was that was actually a funny story behind that song. Is like that. Sometimes, because yeah, I got there's Will Anderson and myself, which have separate kind of roles and contracts, and so whenever they hire me, they have to be like, okay, this is going to be a song, and then they have a budget for that. But when it's a little thing, like a, di a really like a, just a few lines or a ditty, they'll just say like, like let's just have the actors improvise. <laughs> <laughs> and so they brought in Kathy, and they said, um, Kathy, we got this rap. And they'd actually approached me first and said, do you think you need to do anything with this rap? And I'm like, no, no, no. This is supposed to just say these words without a melody, and it's supposed to sound terrible. Like, what am I going to do? Like, there's nothing, nothing for me to do. And so like, oh yeah, we'll just get Kathy to do it. Kathy. So Kathy got it, and she just ad lit that whole spike rap in the studio. And uh, and then later I saw on like Equestrian Daily or something, someone was like, list of your favorite songs. And, and it had all these ratings and like Spike's rap was like way up there. <laughs> and I was like, oh that's embarrassing that for ad lit improvisation that was supposed to sound terrible got I highly voted above uh, half the songs in the show. But um, yeah, so that I didn't really actually do anything with that. That was just all all cat. All right, uh, we're going to form a line. If you have a question for Daniel, just go ahead and line up right to here down the middle. You don't have the mic, right? Can you hear me okay? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, do any of you guys have a question for Daniel? Just go ahead and get in line. Yeah, come on, guys. All right, uh, you guys go first. You just go ahead and just uh, say anything. Uh, say anything. Uh, When writing songs for like different characters, like you have a different process for each one, like certain thoughts that go into a song for Rare and like certain thoughts that go into a Fluttershy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the strengths of this show is, you know, it helps me and because I, we all want to work on getting to know the characters so well. So of course when it's like, hey, let's do our first, you know, even like I'll fly with Rainbow Dash, okay, we're going to do a Rainbow Dash solo the first time all that backstory of Rainbow Dash, and I'm thinking, well, it's not going to be, you know, I'm going to approach that very differently than how I would approach a Fluttershy song or an Apple song or a Vicky song. And each character kind of speaks to their own style. Um, and because in, in My Little Pony, the characters are such, there we go. Like, I guess, archetypes, you know, like they have very strong personalities, it's, it's easy to think, well, what's going to work really well for them? And Rainbow Dash you know, screams out for rock guitars and drums and stuff like that. And I think that was actually established quite early at the gala uh, in season one, when it's like you go through each character's own solo, and it was like, okay, each one has a distinctive sound. And of course, we're thinking about what the actors can do with that. Right. You want to say your name and what else I stand on? Hi, my name is Christina. It's okay. Hey, yeah, I can try. <laughs> She's a singer and a pianist, and we've been looking for your music. You know, she's she music. Coming, yeah, yeah, she's a coming in the book, and we've got to find a proposal. Just wanted to test it. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So, yeah. so we want to know if you could direct her to find that. So it's an excellent point to bring up, and. Um, you know, this is something that I've had a discussion with Hasbro a lot over the last couple of years. <laughs> it was like, hey, release the sheet music. They own the song, right? so they hire me. I'm I'm credited as the songwriter, but they own the, the song, so their publishing domain or whatever. And so it's really up to them to release the sheet music. I, I'm not even allowed to. Like, 
like I do have sheet music for every song that I when I write. But um, they're basic. It's just like chord names, a melody, and lyrics. It doesn't have like a piano accompaniment part written in. And um, so that's the whole process. You know, you have to take a song, you have to a uh, piano arranger, or myself, or someone would have to sit down with it and figure out how to play this. Like, how can you condense this orchestra to the piano part? Um, and then they have to publish it and put it out there. And so that's quite a bit of work. And I really want them to do it. I hear almost like on a daily basis, or at least a weekly basis, music teachers coming to me saying, hey, my student's asking for your sheet music. But I can tell out of my hand, the most I can do is keep saying to Hasbro, hey, get this sheet music out. There's a band for it. And so anything you can do to just tell them that, the more they hear it, the more they get on that. Have a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's in the works. I do think it's yeah, we've been hunting them. Yeah. I mean, it took them about years to put out a soundtrack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they're catching up. Okay. Thank you. Hi. What are you up to? 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 That, um, to be questioned, that album in particular I had nothing to do. So they had asked me, after the, after the opening oh. titles of The Rest of the Girls 1, which I did a kind of remix thing for, they said, okay, hey, we want to do now a whole remix album inspired by, by the growing community. And I said, well, I did that one remix and it's really hard for me to do it. It's not really good. And it's uh, better to write a song. And so uh, they said, well, that's cool. We're going to go out and find the information. And then I'm like, yeah, that's how it should make I didn't even know what songs they were doing or anything. And so they, they um, I, I haven't even heard it. Uh, no. Is it good? <laughs> Is it good? Uh, yeah, no, I didn't have anything. How do you tell that you've got a physical release and all that? I think it might be something to do with I have no idea. I have no idea how they did all that work. Where they got all loose. I don't think it's length. I think it might be more to do with. Like they're trying to get those first albums just out in here, and then they get them on iTunes or wherever, and then they're like, on to the next one, and now the digital release or the remix album came later, and now they were like, okay, now we have a means to place the physical album. I think they're planning on doing physical copies. I think that's the point. All right, go ahead and say the next, Jacob. I want to know, you do a lot of music writing, but are you classically trained? Like, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I went and did a music undergrad degree in composition. And then I went on to do grad degree composition. I got about three quarters of the way through that. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, I mean, I was I was raised on uh, RCM music theory and counterpoint from university music. So yeah, I mean, that was my background. Do you have a favorite musical instrument? <sighs> That's a good question. To write for or to listen to? Both. Uh, to write for would be uh, cello and. Uh, to, I don't know, I was a huge fan of the violin. I wrote about four violin solos before I started doing TV. Uh, so, I think that was one of the most challenging and yet most beautiful classical years. Now, um, like my question is regarding to the creation in our town. Like, what, what were like, the influences like, on the creation of that particular song? Yeah, that's a good question. So, in our town, by the opener. Um, yeah, so with that song and the, you know, the message in that episode is kind of like a little bit talking about pitfalls of like aggressive conformity. And so I, I did go and listen to like propaganda World War II marches. <laughs> it was awkward. And having my search history. <laughs> um, but it was really interesting to listen to those marches. And I'm trying to remember who the artists were, like Sousa, or those early, like those um, German composers who were writing those. And I, and I watched, and I listened to a bunch of those and sort of realized, oh, they're all just like three chords, four chords, really simple. Um, but that was the idea to kind of reference that, okay. that sort of more propaganda 1940s sort of style. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.
today. Uh, I just want to say a quick thank you. You know, you made me wait four and a half years for it for all fly. Thank you for writing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah.
was your favorite song? My favorite song? For the show? Yeah, for the show. People ask me that a lot, and I always keep changing my answer. Um, but you keep on writing more. Yeah. I, think, I mean, I was actually adding it up, and I was like, how many songs have I written that have not been released yet? And it's like 60. It's a lot of songs. And so it gets confusing for me, because uh, and that's not just Pony, but for the Western Girls and My Little Pony and Unreleased Things, Secret Face, and, um, and Little Hedgehog. And, uh, and so sometimes I kind of like, it's usually whatever I'm working on right now, I'm like super excited. The thing that I've just finished for season six, this is the next one. But then I yeah. go back years later and I kind of go like, wow, like yeah. certain songs like, like Smile song we're talking about, like that really have staying power, and other songs that that really I thought at the time were quite good and just went away. I mean, I remember when I, when I was listening to that stage, somebody was playing great this bar, no, no. And, and like a lot of people don't really like comment or like that song very much. I remember at the time thinking, oh man, people are gonna love this song. That's <laughs> <laughs> actually one of my favorite friends. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. 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 Part. Good. Yeah, we're in the studio recording, so we're kind of with to get the choir on that song, like the Lapple family that's going to be, we had hired Michelle Reaver's mom as choir, um, and they, they come in and we book the recording studio with Brian Adams recording, a fancy, expensive studio, we had an engineer recording with 30 people, and they're singing on a bunch of songs in that season, and um, I remember one of the kids kind of giggling, it was, it was like university students, and they kind of, and we're in the group, yeah, with Jason Teeson, the, the, the director, and we're like going, what are they giggling about? And I'm like, yeah, what's so funny? And they're like, oh, and she just said racist barn. And it was like, <laughs> long pause, and Jason and I sort of like, what's that about it? And we each other went, oh, no, that's a good idea. And I'm like, what? And then he was like, I think we can change it to, Build this barn? <laughs> I'm like, build this barn, build this barn. I don't know. And then he's like, ah, oh, just leave it. It's fine. <laughs> and we were trying to get people to really enunciate, like, raise this barn. <laughs> anyway, that was a little bit of an oversight. Well, again, they get personal. So. Yeah. I was trying to find out, like, raise as an R A D E. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I couldn't be burning this barn. So, yeah. <laughs> Without the visuals, but it's was there any songs that you had to like redo completely from the start or any songs that you got most of the way through but then had to yeah yeah let's get a few I mean uh you know the song. I mean, that just kind of bothered me, but in the end, it was the best. It was uh, the, the ballad of the Crystal Ponies. Mm -hmm. That song. Yeah. Um, so I had written that song out of a completely different opening melody uh, for kids. And the executive in charge of the time, she's not there anymore, but she was getting a lot of pressure. And it was funny because season one and Hasbro was really. You know, so busy that the show was just pretty much Lauren's show, you know, doing what she wanted. And, and the director and the key creative people out of charge. And then suddenly in season two, like, Asbro was paying a lot more attention. And Lauren had left. And, and they were telling her, they were putting a lot of pressure on her. And so she heard the, the melody I wrote. And she's like, I don't know, it sounds familiar. Like, it sounds too much like winter wrap up. And I didn't think it sounded anything like that. So, she was, so the very last minute, it was like, we need you to rewrite that opening. And so the original opening of that song, I felt like so much better, you know. And then um, we recorded it, and I, and I was the end of it. But I listened back years later to remind myself, and actually the original opening really wasn't that much better. <laughs> so it was fun. But I had to rewrite that. Um, I had to, I just needed a small song, I talked about that. Um, uh, Map Seed, I think this, this is kind of common knowledge, Map Seed was, was originally a much more, he a much heavier rock song. And they were like, eh, it's a show. That was the same, around the same time. So that got Cody and Cody to do some sound a little more Cody. Yeah, that song? Yeah, 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 that was a lot, got a lot of covers. It's catchy, I guess. Um, Sorry, who? Oh, did he do the, 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 the Um, yeah, 
Yeah, that was that was magic being redone. I think that's gonna be great. I'm trying to think if there was another one. I do feel like there's been a few times when it comes to me and it's like, ah, oh, just let it go and do it again. Um, but I think for my own psychology, I just forget it. Like I just like, oh, okay, I'm not gonna put that. I know a little those catch up, I might have to rewrite it in four or five songs. On Pony, it would give me a lot more uh, faith, so I don't have to rewrite. I don't think I've had to rewrite much. Thank you. What was your biggest inspiration when you started making music? And what's your biggest inspiration? Yeah. Yeah. What, was the, what was the question I want to hear? Uh, the question was, what was my biggest inspiration when I started writing, as opposed to my biggest inspiration today? Um, I mean, I started writing... I never really wrote songs in most of my music. Like, I was writing score, and I was writing classical music. And uh, and so um, I was really inspired by like modern, like I was inspired by like Eberstein, kind of like romantic composers, and modern modern composers like Debussy and Bells. So I was really into texture, musical texture. So, so then when I started writing songs, there was the first song I ever wrote was the theme song for Martha Speaks, and it was just like, hey, we need a theme song. And I'm like, well, I've never written a song, but try it. And, um, and then over the last 10, 12 years of songwriting, I've written over 200 different songs or something now. And I'm like, really love songwriting. And so in that process, now I've become very influenced by songwriters. And so uh, my favorite, like, current songwriters, you know, like, huge Alan Nankin. And Alan Nankin being composed by, kind of like, you know, Beauty and the Beast and Little, 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 Little Mermaid. Um, and, uh, you know, Tangled and all the incredible Disney classics. Um, so I spend a lot of time listening to Alan Nankin and studying the scores. Uh, I also spend a lot of time listening to Robert Lopez, who's like, who wrote, you know, Avenue Q and Songs of Frozen and uh, Hope to Mormon. So now I'd say my influences are much less in this classical composer sphere and much more into like great songwriters of our age. Thank you. All right, we got enough time for two more questions, guys. Well, um, what kind of artist are you? Well, like, definitely want to do animation, things like that. Do you want to do, like, songwriting, or did you do more instrumental stuff? Yeah. Because I... Kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of bad. Well, I use two... Because I, 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 I have two different ways of writing music. I write score, the background the score, underscore, whatever you can call it, with logic, and a giant array of, like, 10,000 samples. And so I'll sit down and write, like, using a lot you know, at the computer, right? But when I'm writing songs, I actually am a bit of a purist at heart. I think for songs, I try to use as little technology as possible. So usually, when I song write, it will be just like me and a guitar or a piano, and a piece of music, and it's a cheap music. And it's, and I'm thinking, if you're going to write a good song, I've said this before, you know, some, uh, you know, a kid on YouTube will hear a hip hop song and they will like play it on the guitar and sing it by themselves, or they'll sing it on piano. And so, no matter how fancy your production is, no matter how like many vocals you have, no matter how good your mix is, none of that matters compared to how good is the melody and the lyrics and and the chords. And so, if that's what matters most, then I usually would say like songwriting, get away from the technology first. Write a good song that you can just play on piano and sing, and uh, or guitar whatever your instrument is. No. Well, then that's yeah. So I don't, I don't. That's the new way for sure. I and mean, I don't do a lot of digital production. So I have guys. With me. <laughs> so, so like I, I did do like a dubstep thing, and honestly for that I, 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 I just found a really good dubstep music library and just spent a couple of days just assembling it together. But I'm not really. Sorry, what? You like that one? That was my one and only attempt at doing that. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's called Music to My Ears. Music to My Ears, I bought the album. Yeah, for sure. It's got the, you know, Final Scratch or DJ Fox to be kind of like walking around town. Music to My Ears. Music to My Ears. Alright, thank you. Yeah, that's it. Hey, Chris. 
when you create music for the show, and I mean, sorry, you created music for the show, and you created music for the question of movies. Do you approach the creation of the songs differently? Than oh, you yeah. Okay, so you're talking about the difference between pony and Crash right. Girls? Yeah, it's pony versus humans. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I went into Crash Girls, but oh, like this needs to be a different sound. Pony's pretty organic, you know, it's a lot of solos, duets. Uh, kind of musical theater influenced with touches of folk pop. Uh, uh Girls is like girls in high school, so it's more pop influenced and vocal band, vocal group influenced. So I'm thinking like Glee almost or something. Like I'm going, well, why don't we have this cool sound? We have like six amazing singers or seven amazing singers with Sunset, Sunset Shimmer all singing together. So it's a really different hit. I'm trying to write kind of maybe Broadway or Pony mostly, and then I'm trying to write like my best attempt, you know, a uh, hybrid pop song. Hey, thank you so much for joining us once again. Thank you, everyone.